Greetings, and welcome to episode 57. In today's episode, we're going to discuss hiding, and we're going to figure out what it is you're hiding from. And if you're not hiding, we're going to teach you how to help somebody else figure out what they're hiding from. Sometimes people hide and they do not even realize they're hiding. But we'll get into that and we'll cover all of this in today's episode. So if we're ready, let's get started. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy. So, what are you hiding from? And if you're not hiding, how can you help someone that is? Well, let's give a for instance. Let's say we know this young man. We'll call it a man for sake of argument instead of female. It's really not important, the gender of the person in this scenario. And let's just say, for instance, this person is an addict, but they're not really an addict. And before you say, well, uh, let me explain. <laughs> and I can tell, and you would be able to tell they're not an addict because they'll get high on anything. And an addict has a particular item they use, and they use that particular item every time. Somebody that just needs to get out of this reality for using any means necessary is probably not an addict. They're running from something. They would prefer you to think of them as an addict than for you to think of them as whatever it is they're hiding from. It's usually just, to them it seems like a, a mountain, it's the end of the world, it would crush them completely and totally and destroy them if anyone found out. But to anybody else it's usually just a molehill. So that's why people just don't get why people do things like that. Why to you or I, it's not okay to be perceived as something, to hide from something else. I mean you're purposely throwing up a negative perception to hide from the other perception, other possible perception. Because you, the person, or you, if it's you, won't know for sure what the perception will become if anybody found out whatever the secret is. It's a coping mechanism. Hiding behind something else. Like a sad person going around making people happy and making them laugh all the time. That's a coping mechanism. It's a hiding place. Because you perceive them as happy, you're not going to go bother them about, well, what's the matter? Because you perceive them as happy. It's a hiding place. And that's not to say that everybody that's happy and makes you laugh is sad. I like to make people laugh. I like to make people happy. I'm not sad about anything. But that doesn't mean that at one point I didn't use such techniques to hide emotional hurts and usually it's that's what it is it's something emotional or it could be some action this person performed that they're embarrassed or ashamed of. they're gonna hide behind something else they're not really an addict now anything can become habit forming anything but Let's say the person in the scenario is doing everything right down to huffing oxygen. Oxygen is a chemical that we get anyway, but taken in, in repeatedly in, in mass quantity, say like someone, say you stole your grandma's oxygen tank and you're sitting in the corner and you crank it on full and just, you can get high on that. If that's what you're doing to get high, you're not an addict. You would rather be perceived as an addict than be perceived as whatever it is you're hiding from. Everything we do comes with a label. It's not always a good label. 
and some people would rather be seen as an alcoholic, an addict, whatever, rather than be seen as whatever it is they're hiding from. We can all tell. I can't imagine there's a soul on the planet that can't tell when someone is faking that kind of an addiction or has a fake smile. Not all fake smiles can be seen through. Just like when somebody's just cranky and an asshole all the time, that's probably their coping mechanism for something else. The trouble with that particular one, nobody cares to get through that one. That's why they say those that are the hardest to love need it the most because it takes a really, really strong and patient person to get through that particular coping mechanism, the, the asshole coping mechanism, or for females, the bitch coping mechanism. It took years. I can, I know one that used the bitch mechanism for years, and I'm married to her, and it took me years to get through it, years to get through it. But when I broke through it, it kind of lessened for everyone just because I broke through it. Now, she still uses that as a coping mechanism, but not nearly as much as she used to. And that's how I know that it can be corrected. If you can get at why the coping mechanism is in place in the first place, people just people try and get at the symptoms. The coping mechanism is the symptom of the problem. The fake addiction or habit or whatever it is, the asshole vibe, whatever they're doing. Some and don't get me wrong, some people are just assholes. That's just who they are. But some people use that as a coping mechanism. I've seen people just are so attractive they hide behind their flesh and it's like a mask to them and you sh I see them and I'm like whoa they're hiding behind their flesh because their flesh gets such a positive response they can hide all their sins back there and all people will see is that pretty face or that handsome face I've seen people hide behind their weight problem. I've seen people hide behind the fact that they think they're unattractive. Whether or not they're unattractive is irrelevant. It's the fact that they're hiding behind that. Because that to them is easier to deal with than whatever it is they're hiding behind it. People generally will try to get at the symptoms. Like, oh, wow, you're so beautiful. Or, oh, you're not ugly. Or, I can help you through your, your, your alcoholism or your, your drug addiction. Or, why, you know, you don't have to be an asshole to everybody. Or, you don't have to be a bitch to everybody. You're, you're, you're poking at the symptoms. A better question would be, what happened to you to make you be such an asshole? Boom. A better statement to an addict or a drunk. What happened to make you hide in a bottle? Or to hide in this chemical? Or whatever it is they're doing. They would rather be seen as something negative. That's like really negative. Because if someone would rather be perceived as a drunk or as an addict rather be perceived I mean these are really negative being a bitch being labeled a bitch being labeled an asshole these are the like the most negative things you can be labeled that are above criminal labels <laughs> that's like the lowest of the civilian ranks <laughs> is addict bitch asshole or drunk so what is it that they're going through that being labeled an addict or a drunk is an improvement? What are they hiding from? What are you hiding from if you're one of the people hiding? Are you hiding behind your face? Your clothing? Your friends? Some aspect of, some outward aspect. Because, let's face it, Drugs, external. Liquor, external. Your looks, external. Your friends, external. 
your clothing external. What are you hiding behind all that? I have no secrets. Ask me anything. Because it's more important to me to have a clear connection, have to have that clean signal going on. Constant upload. Completely open. 100%. So when people want you to keep a secret, and you know what I mean when I say keep a secret, I don't mean they've whispered in your ear, I mean you're keeping a secret. They're using you as a hiding spot. I can't do that, because that'll cause me to close off some part of me that I need open. Because you never know which pathway is going to be used to receive information. So it's a hundred percent no. If you've done some dirt, I can't have your back. Don't do dirt. That's don't do any don't 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 do things that would require you to need a hiding spot, a mental or emotional hiding spot. But that's friends, no? See, everyone says that. I could never grasp that. That, that. A true friend would... Really? Because the way I'm looking at it, a true friend would never ask you to sell yourself short for their benefit. Well, what about family? Family's the same way. If all your family does is trip you up, you wouldn't go around everyday people that do that, why would you go around family that does that? Obviously I'm more important to me than I am to you. Even at the lowest point. So why would I why would I put myself in that situation? I don't have anything to hide. I'm not gonna help you hide. I can help you get at what you're hiding from and get rid of it. Come to terms with it so that it's not bothering you anymore. That is the disease. Everything else is just a, it's a symptom. If you feel like you have to hide, you get an anxiety. Oh, I'm bipolar. It's funny because everybody I know that's bipolar has been through some hellacious emotional shit. And everything with a magnetic energy or, or an electric energy is bipolar. There's two poles. I don't know why they call it that. <laughs> Everybody has on, off, hot, cold, pissed, happy. Everybody. Well, those people go to extremes. Everybody goes to extremes. They don't know why it switches on and off so quick. It's because they have more triggers. But we're going to get at the symptoms because, well, if I'm a therapist, it's more lucrative for me to just get at the symptoms because you'll keep coming back. There's always going to be symptoms. And I know that. I'm not going to lump all your symptoms in one and get at the disease because if I go one symptom at a, one symptom at a time, that's going to take years. I could put my kids through college on one person or two or three people getting at one symptom at a time. Or just go through and hit the disease. What's bothering you? But see, the one thing I've learned, like my wife suggested counseling one time. And I said, what's the point? You won't tell me what's bothering you. You expect me to believe you're going to tell them what's bothering you? <laughs> and she said... Yeah, good point. <laughs> and we sat and we talked about it. Problem solved. If you need to go to a counselor or a therapist, I view it like this. I used to do readings for people, runes and tarot cards. And the one thing I noticed, the questions they would ask. If you want a reading done, you already know the answer. 
You just don't like the answer. <laughs> if you got to go to a therapist, you already know what's wrong. You just don't want to talk about it. You don't want it to come up because the way it makes you feel. And the sucky part about getting at the disease as opposed to the symptoms, the trick to not hiding anymore, you just got to turn it all out. Turn yourself out. Let those secrets bubble to the surface and hold on for dear life. Each secret. Let it bubble to the surface and then hold on for dear life. Because it's funny what you're afraid of. God already knows what you've done. So you're not afraid of what God thinks of you. You're afraid of what the other human beings around you will think of you. And this plays right into the scenario of this guy that, that is pretending to be a, an addict. But the funny thing is, the, the most striking part about this person pretending to be an addict, they only become an addict when they make an emotional connection with someone. Something about making that connection triggers whatever the disease is, which triggers the symptom, pretending to be an addict. And that could be said for everything. Now, don't get me wrong. Not everyone that drinks is hiding. Some people just like to drink. Some people are addicted to the drink for the sake of the chemical addiction, for the sake of the happy vibe, whatever. And they're not hiding at all. They just, they know what they want and they, they want it now. Same goes for the, for chemical addiction, drinking, uh, people that flaunt their good looks aren't always hiding. They just know they're good looking and hey, come look at this. They know they're dressed well. Hey, come look at this. And so on and so forth. That's not always symptoms. You have to know what you're looking for. But when you can tell, when you know, when you know this person is hiding behind whatever it is they're doing, it is, if the person is a friend of yours, now if you don't really know the person, you just tell they're full of shit, and that's how it comes across. When the person is hiding behind what it is they're doing, they will come across as being completely full of shit. And you'll have this question. At least this is how it strikes me. And there'll be a question here and here. In here, how do I help this person? In here, it's, really? You really don't think I can see through this? What's ailing you, boy? Spit it out. <laughs> I My question would be to whatever person is hiding... If I didn't know them, I would probably try and get to know them. Because no one should have to hide. I can't not imagine. I, you know what? I can't imagine because when I was younger, I did used to hide. But I hid in plain sight. And I would offer that to anybody. If you're going to hide, hide in plain sight. Because then, after you, it'll just hit you one day that why, why I'm, I'm not hiding anything really anyway. Just live my life. But when you are hiding behind something, that the act of hiding itself, even when that emotional trigger becomes unimportant, that act of hiding not only welcomes people that will use you as a hiding spot because well you gotta be hiding something big but it becomes a habit for you to hide so even when these things no longer bother you you're still hiding because you've developed this as your persona so you honestly think that well this is my personality this is who I am after a while even after the trigger is long dead and you, it doesn't work anymore, you'll still be this person. 
Because that's who you think you are. You've done it for so long. What is, you'll never outrun yourself, whether it's childhood hurts or embarrassments, teenage hurts or embarrassments, uh, young adult hurts or embarrassments, adult hurts or embarrassments, old age, young, you'll never outrun yourself. You will always be there when you get there. And you are the only one that suffers from hiding. And like I said, if it's not you, then it's it's someone you know. And they are the only one that suffers. And if you go along with it, knowing they're full of shit, knowing there's something there, you're enabling them. And you've become part of the problem. You've become one of the symptoms. Because now, especially if you're like one of their close companions that you're with them on a daily basis, you're now part of the persona. You're part of the personality. Now their symptoms don't even work without you. Now, me making this video, I'm working under the assumption that you want to be free of this. And that you want a cleaner connection to source. This is how you get it. This is how you clean out the closet. If it's you that's experiencing it, understand that you will never be free of it until you are honest with yourself about whatever moment is bothering you. And if you're not sure what it is, follow the trigger. Whatever triggers it will lead you to it. Because usually the primary or uh, the, the immediate reaction when something is triggered is to curry up and shut it off. So what you do is when it's triggered, instead of shutting it off, follow the trigger. Follow where it goes. Follow the what. Let the memory, let the emotion, let everything come forward and experience it. Because that's the only way to get rid of it. You could be running from things that happened in your childhood that are no longer even valid anymore. But because it was triggered, Because it was triggered, you'll run from it. The longer you let it fester, the more damage it'll do later. What you need to do It's just let it go before the symptoms become a habit and if the symptoms have already become a habit let it go anyway and then you'll have no reason to have these triggers and these triggers won't trigger your symptoms Don't just get rid of the triggers because you'll still have the symptoms. You'll still hide. You just won't have anything to immediately trigger the fear response that causes you to dig deeper into whatever hiding spot you have. And people could say, well, that's easy for you to say. No, it's not easy for me to say. It's easy for me to say because I've been there and I got through it. People rely on the misery loves company. You ain't perfect. No, you don't have to be perfect. 
And I'm not perfect. I just sin differently than you. <laughs> and I don't run from the sins I do commit. <laughs> Those are none of your business, but I'm not running from them. <laughs> and not everything we're running from is something we've done. Sometimes it's something that was done to us. And what's funny is, of all the stuff that was done to me, I've never run from any of that. I only run from the stuff I've done. And I had some pretty bad stuff happen to me. Never have I run from it. I've always remembered it since it happened. But I've never run from it. Because I'd never bothered me enough to run from it. I wasn't embarrassed or ashamed of it. It was just, to me, it was an experience. I guess I could put it in a context. I couldn't understand why people acted like they do toward the stuff that happened to me and the stuff that happened to them. I'm like, it's just the moment why I think people learn that response and learn that that's the appropriate response when something bad happens to you or when you do something bad to someone else that you're ashamed of. I don't honestly think people understand that the symptoms are learned, the triggers are learned, the hiding, even the hiding spot is learned. There's nothing that's ever happened to you and, and vice versa there's nothing you've ever done to anyone that's worth hiding from because if hell really did exist you'd have to go through it twice you'd have to go through it living as a living person and then you'd die and go to hell because anything that causes you to suffer that badly through your whole life is that would qualify to drag you down into hell because hell isn't just for bad people hell is a is a extremely negative disposition you can create hell on earth now just imagine if you die with that disposition and you don't have all of this shiny stuff to distract you from it. I think it's imperative that you take care of it now rather than wait. Well, you know, when I die, yeah, when you die, you won't have a choice. It's coming out. You have nothing to hide behind then. There will be no chemicals. Don't wait until you die to fix it. It is very easy to fix. It's the simplest thing you'll ever do. Likewise, it is the most difficult thing you will ever accomplish. How many years did it take me to get the hang of not hiding? Ten? No. Five years. Six years. Six years of constantly going over everything to make sure there were no triggers. To make sure I didn't give myself a hiding spot. It takes a lot of alone time and soul searching. You have to rebuild yourself according to these things not being in you anymore. It's like quitting smoking. You have to relearn how to do everything without that thing in your hand. But it can be done. I've done it. And this isn't, ha, oh, lofty me, I've done it. This is, if I can do it, you can do it because I'm nobody. 
That's what I mean when I say that. If I can do it, you can do it. Because I'm nobody. And you're somebody. You'll thank me. First you'll curse my name, but then you'll thank me. <laughs> What's funny is, you will curse my name if you try this. <laughs> Because I almost kicked myself in the ass for doing it. Because it felt like I, it was getting worse at first. Like experiencing your worst fears. It's like someone breaking into your house. And you're well armed. But you tell yourself, don't move from this spot. And you have this overwhelming sensation that this person's coming to kill you, this person's coming to kill you, this person's coming to kill you. And, and each time it gets a little bit better. At first the person breaks into the house and you grab the guns and you start shooting. And the second time the person gets in the house and they get through to the first room. And it goes that way until the person makes it all the way upstairs. And then finally the person makes it all the way into the bedroom. And then finally the person's standing right next to you and you still haven't grabbed your weapons and then you look over and you see that the person is you and you've been fighting yourself the whole time we the human mind is a very powerful thing you can convince yourself that everybody's against you when it's really just you you can convince yourself that everybody hates you. You can convince yourself that nobody likes you. You can convince yourself of anything. You can convince yourself that so-and-so is attacking me. When really it's just you. That's what happens when we neglect ourselves. Our shadow runs amok. That thing, that person that broke into the house, that's your shadow. And your shadow doesn't care if it happened to you or if you did it to someone else. If it's causing you to suffer, your shadow is going to help you get rid of it. But you're terrified of your shadow. Everybody is. Most people are, I should say. 99.9999% of the population are terrified of their own shadow. So when they see it, they imagine that it's someone they don't like or something terrifying coming to get them. So by the time that thing gets upstairs... And you still haven't grabbed your weapons. And it's standing next to you now. And you still haven't grabbed your weapons. And then you look over and it's you. That's how it works. When the Do not throw up the alarm. Do not grab your weapons. Let it in the house. Let it roam around. Let it come upstairs. Let it get you. It's not going to kill you. It's not even there to steal. It's actually there to make sure you're alright. If you put a face on it, then part of the problem is whoever's face you put on that. If you feel a particular intent, then part of the reason is has to do with something to do with that intent. Did you have that intent towards somebody? Or does somebody have that intent towards you? Who knows? But that's how you get rid of what you're hiding from. You're just hiding from yourself. Hmm. Another good episode. <laughs> but we're getting on past the 30 minute mark. If you have liked this episode. If you have enjoyed this episode I should say. Because I'm going to use the word like again. And that sounds weird when we say like like. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> If you have enjoyed this episode, please click the like button. See? See how that worked? Enjoy. Like instead of like, like. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> click the like button. You can favor the video if you want. Uh, comments down below. Love them. Mm. Thanks for leaving them. If you don't leave them, that's fine. But, uh, yeah, if you would like to come back and keep getting more information, or you just like the sound of my voice, Please hit the subscribe button. 
But until next time, you hang in there. <laughs>